Turn to John chapter 6, please. John chapter 6. Now, we went through the whole gospel of John not long ago on Wednesday night. I'd like to go back and glean some things from that chapter that I think will be needful to us and about anything we do. I think it's one of the richest contexts of the entire Bible. I think that when you think of the human being that wrote it and then that he was inspired of the Spirit recording things concerning proofs of Jesus Christ being deity, the one thing that shines forth is that truly Jesus Jesus is deity. He is the only begotten Son of God. And his teaching stands out as simply matchless. And they... Show us the way of life through Jesus Christ. And if there is a truly majestic theme pervading the entire 71 verses that make up this chapter, then I think you'll see that this is one of the chapters that we ought to have or ought to be familiar with concerning Jesus Christ. And we would simply say all of these verses in the chapter would be summarized, at least I think so, by saying Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Now some of the best known verses from our life, our Lord's life on earth and his work can be found in John chapter 6. And here's what I mean by that. We can learn from this chapter about our Lord that he came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Verse 38. And that he alone has the words of, of life, verse 68. And the Redeemer, in one of what we would say is his famous I am passages, is proclaimed to be, as we said, the bread of life, verses 44 through 45. In that passage, verses 44 through 45, There's a drawing power of Christ himself, drawing all men through the word of God, bringing them to God. I guess we sometimes, in being familiar with these truths, fail to realize that somebody had to draw men to God. And that Christ is the one, by his very existence, becoming man, all things that he did, supplies the necessary drawing power of God for man to be brought to him. So all in all, in these few verses of John chapter 6, you can see so much depth and uh, so much clarity and beauty as to the teaching that goes on here. If you think about it, how beautiful it is that God has ordained a way to draw sinful man to him. That man whose mind's elsewhere, usually doing as he pleased or attempting to, can be caused to be drawn to God, but it's through Christ that that happens. It's a rather amazing thing when you think about it. And thus Christ would say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. So God's drawing power, as it has to do with man being drawn to God, is only through Jesus Christ, ultimately and finally and completely. So Jesus feeds the multitudes with scanty provisions, And even walks on a very stormy sea. 
And all things done in between is designed to say, without me, ye can do nothing. So it's, I think it's rather, if you think about it, no matter how many times you read it, if you really give thought to what's being said here, it can be almost breathtaking when you study this section of God's good word. Now, the sixth chapter of John also is one that's somewhat controversial. I found out in my own experience that there's hardly anything in the Bible that somebody doesn't oppose. If you take any truth and do the very nature of truth, it can be stated in propositional form, and somebody's going to deny it. Somebody's going to say that's not right. So we have then, due to a misuse of verses 48 through 58, some controversy that has come up over many hundreds of years, started a long time ago. And if it were not for the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, such mistakes in a lot of places, even among churches not Catholic, would not probably be so large. Now we who have always been associated with God through the Bible and believing it's the only way the truth is preached and fully preached and completely set out. And because we come from backgrounds like that, we don't quite see how that happens, but transubstantiation has to do with the what we know as the Lord's Supper. They would call it Eucharist. And they actually believe that when the priest blesses the bread, then it becomes the body, literal, actual body of Christ. Same with the fruit of the vine becoming his blood. But because that's true, if you're ever going to study with somebody influenced greatly by that false doctrine, you're going to have to know how to answer it. Now, that usually gets dragged over into John 6 because of what he says and I have to bring it up though that's not really what he's talking about here when Jesus says eat my flesh and drink my blood many years ago I heard a gospel preacher in a lectureship as well as some other preachers in the audience try to link this up with the Lord's Supper this is not a lesson on the Lord's Supper but usually you talk about it and we had a lesson a few weeks ago on the Lord's Supper because so many people do see that especially those who are Roman Catholic and believe that when the priest blesses the bread, it becomes the actual flesh of Christ and the fruit of the vine becomes the actual blood of Christ. And so naturally, they're going to look at something like this and say, well, it must be talking about the Eucharist, as they would call it. But that's not what it is. We will talk about it a little bit. So the question really would be to get people, to get them to ask was, was our Lord referring to the Lord's Supper in John 6, 48 through 58? And very quickly, he was not. He was not at all. It was not until the 12th century that the Roman Catholic Church, at the Council of Tours, T-O-U-R-S, officially taught that the actual body and blood of the Christ were present in what they call the Eucharist. And uh, misguided, to be nice about it, brethren play into the hands of error when they apply then the words of John 6 to the Lord's Supper. Now, if you go back over to Luke 22 in verse 30, Jesus makes exceedingly clear what the situation is. That is that the Lord's Supper is only for citizens of the kingdom of heaven and not the world. Now we, I think, discussed that somewhat in our sermon of recent date concerning the Lord's Supper. But if you notice in John 6 and verse 51, listen to what he says. The bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Well, he's talking about doing what's necessary, what he 
was compelled to do what he was sent to do. In living as a man tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. And thus, he would be offered for sin. The Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. But the Lord's Supper is not for the world at all. It's for faithful members of the church of our Lord. So he couldn't be, if there are not other reasons you could note, he couldn't be here in John 6 talking about the Lord's Supper. But then somebody may rise up and ask, and maybe properly so, if that is the case, and he's not talking about the Lord's Supper, where the bread represents his body and the fruit of the vine represents his blood shed for the remission of sins. What is he talking about in John 6, 48 through 58? Well, notice he begins this by talking to the Jews and their very foundation in the Old Testament and their full knowledge of how they came to existence and the wilderness wanderings and all those things. So he refers to the manna in the wilderness as contrasted with himself. Remember when they saw the bread that was applied, it would appear every morning, very small, like coriander seed. And the people said, what is it? And the way they said, what is it in Hebrew was manna. <laughs> so really you see that that's a type, that is the manna, so the bread from heaven that fed flesh in Israel, that manna, is typical of what? Of the Christ. The bread of life. The bread of life. Notice, partake of me and live. Jesus declares plainly that. Partake of me and live. What, how do you partake of Christ today? Well, we fill ourselves with the Spirit of Christ through the knowledge of His conduct and His will for our lives. We imitate His thinking. He, in effect, is saying, follow me. I'm the way to heaven. And we started the sermon out with that matter. Uh, how do we become more like Christ, more spiritual, more on the level of, of Christ? Through constant practice of the truth. Whose truth? Christ did. Now, Notice how this fits with what he's going to say two chapters later in John 8, 31 and 32. If ye continue in my word, ye are my disciples indeed in what you do. And what's going to happen? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, we have, we're not going to take the time this afternoon to do this. But pa passages that are bearing on these very points are found throughout the New Testament. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9. Philippians 2 and verse 5. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. And 2 Peter 3, 8. This sentiment, this idea is presented by the apostles and all those passages. And those letters, every one of them, were written to Christians to remind them of the great sacrifice of Christ to save us. And you have him saying likening himself to the brazen serpent raised up in the wilderness. If I be lifted up, then all men shall be drawn to me. Again, the idea of he's the drawing power. There is no drawing power. That is a power put out in this world to draw men to God except the drawing power of Christ. So that shouldn't surprise us when Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Gentile, to the Jew, and so forth. Well, that involves our human makeup, our intellect, our reasoning, our power to will, and so on. Because that's how he appeals to us. Christ, apart from the doctrine of Christ, can't have any influence over us if we remain free moral agents and choose God over the ways of the world. We often point out that's one of the ways we know God loves us because he wants to give us the freedom to come to him, to choose him, 
Well, how, what draws us? Power of God saved. What's that? The gospel. What do you mean the gospel? The glad tidings of Christ. So it's a joy to be able to partake of the divine nature. It doesn't mean we become God. The very idea of God means you can't become God. But it means he's authored a way whereby we can partake of the divine nature. And thus, ultimately and finally and forever, eternally, when the world's over and resurrected, saved men are going into heaven, they are glorified even as Christ is glorified now. So we need to think on these things because they're designed to use biblical terms, guide us as we go on to perfection, as we go on to become more like him. Now, the next question that always follows this question of John chapter 6, I think can easily be anticipated. And, and it had a place back in church history. It was the basis of a famous debate in what was called the Council of Marburg 450 years ago, close to 500, that was between Martin Luther and a man by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. I'll pause here and interject this. Out of all the Reformationists in the 1500s into the 1600s that were closer to the right way to approach the Bible, Ulrich Zwingli was the best one because he took the position that you could only act on what the words of the Bible authorize you to act. While Martin Luther, who became probably he and Calvin, the ones that uh, are most remembered for the Protestant Reformation in Europe, took the position, if it's not expressly commanded, then you can do it. I don't know why people who thought as well as they did, and they had to do a lot of serious thinking to come out of the errors they were in and to suffer for what they suffered for, couldn't see that with that kind of reasoning, if it's not expressly forbidden in the Scriptures, that they had nothing they could do about saying it's wrong to kiss the Pope's toe as the vicar of Christ on earth because he didn't say that explicitly in the scriptures. But they didn't think that way for whatever reason. But this discussion between Zwingli and Luther are based upon the words of Matthew chapter 26 where he instituted the Lord's Supper. People who just will not see the nature and use of figurative language are always going to have a problem with what the Lord had to say when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And they're going to stumble in the Bible over certain statements of Jesus and other teachings of the Bible that are not literal. When Christ said, this is my body, people think, and they teach it. The actual body of Christ. In fact, we've got brethren who many, many, many years ago split the church over the idea of one cup because they couldn't see cup without seeing one container. And it was the whole idea. When you pay, partake of the fruit of the vine in the observance of the Lord's Supper, it's the fruit of the vine that's the one cup, regardless of how many containers it's in. The one cup is the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of Christ. But we've got brethren in this present hour in some places who cannot separate cup from container. So they will have only one container and think you sin if you don't have one container. Or at least that's what they claim to have. The only thing I think that helped get a lot of that out had nothing to do with what the Bible taught and what the Bible teaches alone on it. It's just when people can begin to be more uh, aware of how germs are spread, then they begin to think more the other way. And it's amazing what things that happen to you because you see the Bible in a different light. And that can be for good or bad. So Luther, who could not really, if you look at the debate, handle the, the very brilliant Zwingli, wrote those words in the dust of a table in the conference room at Marburg. He tried vainly, and I say vainly, there was no point to it, to hold to the literal force of the language. 
but it's not literal language. How can you how can you have how can you define something literally when you use literally? But didn't our Lord say in the beginning this is a memorial when he talked about the Lord's Supper? He's not talking about that in John 6. He said, This do in remembrance of me, Luke 22, 19. And there are many other scriptures you can bring to bear on this, but it shows you how one person, one, one person or persons can take a scripture, such as John 6, it's not even talking about the observance of the Lord's Supper, but because it says, take, eat, and so on, my body, my blood, immediately their mind runs to the Lord's Supper, and there's no connection. When you look at a memorial, we talked about this during the lesson on the Lord's Supper, Let's say the Washington Monument in, in Washington, D.C. It's a memorial to the first president of the United States. This is called the father of our country. You don't expect to see George Washington there, but it's a monument to the fact that he lived and what he did when he lived. And so, this is my body, the bread, and the Lord's Supper doesn't mean it's actually his body. Any more than when Jesus, referring to Herod, said, go tell that fox. You know, the people hearing him understood well, he didn't mean Herod was an actual fox animal. And if they would just think about how we speak today, we still do some things. And you say, maybe you kid, you not hid. Did you mean he actually had a knot in his head. Well, that's come to mean a person is not using the brains he's got. <laughs> that's what he amounts to, or the way he acts. And on and on, you just simply put them together. And we, we use a myriad of those things. I think sometimes today, people have lost how colorful the English language can be because they've lost a lot of that kind of uh, descriptive terminology. But if you read a book... If you do read one book <laughs> and you read something to where he's a good author, he'll use all these kind of terms. And we think that's pretty good. Some people, I guess, think that we ought to just talk maybe like a computer and sort of sound this stuff about like that. Please end up and sit down. But that's not the way it works. And the Bible's not written that way. And everything's not literal. We're to take it as literal when there's no reason to take it otherwise. It's not a hard rule to follow. But it's obvious in itself. When Jesus talks of the Lord's Supper, it's a memorial feast. The bread represents the body of Christ offered on the cross. And the blood represented by the fruit of the vine. But in John 6, he's saying, turn to me. Fill yourself with all that I am. And James 1.25 says that we're to continue in the perfect law of liberty. Not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. Well, that's all Christ is saying. So we have memorials. Then you say, see Christ saying, I am the door. Well, do you really think Christ is a door like one of these by which we entered this building? But he is the door by which we enter into the proper relationship with God. He's the door by which we gain forgiveness of sins. These are People ask sometimes, what are the things that can help me understand the Bible? And they seem to think it's going to take a full knowledge of and usage of Greek like Paul could or Moses the use of Hebrew. Well, I'm not saying those things can't help. I'm glad people have been so trained and have the intellectual propensity that they would engage in the study of those things so we can have the Old Testament translated from Hebrew and Aramaic, mostly Hebrew, into uh, English, or the New Testament from Greek into English. I like that. But there's so much more in the way of guidance that you don't even need to do that. So I select John 6 where he's simply saying in all that he says there, I'm the only way there is to God. 
So when he speaks of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, it means you're imbibing, that's a word not used a whole lot nowadays, in all that Christ offers. In order to get the benefit, we studied this last week, of being reconciled to God, justified in his sight, sins forgiven in the minds of God. Because, as he said to the Jews, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That's really important. And thus, he's saying here that all that Christ has to offer must be accepted. So we want to separate those two things and know that some people erroneously go to John 6 to try to justify false doctrine on the Lord's Supper, such as the Roman Catholic error of transubstantiation. Well, once we erase the error, what it's not teaching, then we want to see what he is teaching. And he's teaching what he said in various ways, such as I am the bread and I am the door and all of this. So you can understand that he must be accepted for whom he is. And I can know who he is by what the Bible says and declares about him and the proofs of the same to allow me as an intellectual creature as God gave me to take in the material, honestly reason with it, and make the proper application. And thus, like Thomas, I'll say my Lord and my God. So do we eat his flesh in the way he talked about it today in John 6? And do we drink his blood? If we're faithful to God, we do. And in fact, in order to become a Christian, we do. He is the one and the only one that can save us. Nobody else can. I remind you again in our last studies together in 1 John that the emphasis of John to those who have accepted him is the way, the truth, and the life is brought out again as to the way they grow up and stay faithful and stay steadfast and remain in fellowship with God and that is to turn to Christ and he calls him the righteous he's the only one that has made propitiation for our sins made peace with God on our behalf and when he says be of good cheer we read this awful easy. I don't know that we accept it very much like we ought to. I think we accept it, but I don't think we realize the depths of it. When he says, be a good cheer, I have overcome the world. Who do you know that can say that? And what did he mean when he said, I've overcome it? I overcome the world in the sense of what the world has to offer standing alone. And he has nothing to offer that can save any soul. Nothing. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life governs most people in this world. They're operating according to their own fleshly desires. They seek after them. They use however long they have you on earth to gratify those things. And they miss it all because they do not turn to Jesus and see him as the way, the truth, and the life. These are so fundamental and so plain and simple that sometimes in our preaching, Teaching, we, 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 we overlook the simplicity of it, and the, yet the power that's in those simple terms. Now, if you're not a Christian this afternoon, can you think of a better afternoon to come one since this is all you have? This is all you have. Don't tell me you'll do it tomorrow. Maybe you will next week or next year. You have right now, and that's all you have. That's all God says you have. You can't go back to yesterday. And you have as much hope for tomorrow as you do going back to yesterday, which is none. You do have now. Who gave you this moment? Who in his providential care gave you this moment? God did. What are you going to do with it? Obey the gospel? Or go on out Gambling with your life because you simply may not get home. That's all there is to it. As a child of God, are you faithful? Are you still looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? See how the Hebrew writer brings that same idea out of John 6? 
We look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So don't lose sight of that. Maybe you have certain areas. We urge you to repent of those sins. Come confess to him and pray God for forgiveness. Be wonderful to everybody that's accountable to God right now in this auditorium. When they leave here, they would leave forgiven of sins, added to the church by the Lord, reconciled to him, justified in his sight, and be able to leave as the Ethiopian eunuch did after he rose to the water of grave of baptism, go on their way rejoicing. But I'm telling you, whether you want to accept it or not, you leave here today knowing what you know and the opportunities you've had. How can you rejoice when you leave here knowing you have not used it to obey God? And Christ still stands saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But you've got to open the door. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we humbly beg you to come while we stand and sing.